this work? Okay, so welcome to everybody. My name is Mornay Christo, for those folks that don't know. I'm the uh, Dan Southern Africa CEO, and uh, the webinar sponsor for this evening is Pisces Divers. They're based in Simonstown, uh, just uh, close to Cape Town, and our guest speaker is Lauren Arthur, who I'll introduce in a, in a short while. Now, for the folks that have registered by... Um, um, oh, hang tight. I just see my computer wants to die. We don't want that to happen. Uh, sorry, folks. My bad. There we go. I just want to plug it in. Okay. All right, yeah, so uh, Pisces is uh, based in Simonstown, uh, close to Cape Town, and they've been kind enough to sponsor the Lucky Draw prizes. So for the folks that registered via Zoom, uh, please stick around until the end. Um, I've got a Lucky Draw. Uh, I enter you into the software I have. We pick some random winners. And the prizes up for grab are pretty great. You know, they um, uh, two uh, uh, T-shirts sponsored by uh, Pisces Divers plus two hoodies. So uh, four people can stand the chance. Uh, to win, and there you can see what they look like. So that's the hoodie branded all around, and especially, I guess, uh, on the sardine run, uh, Mike, they come in quite handy. And then uh, there we go, we've got uh, the t shirts that uh, are also branded in Pisces. So, once again, thank you for that. Just uh, for all the folks that are joining this evening, thank you so much. I know your time's valuable, and I really hope that you're going to enjoy uh, the webinar and I uh, hope that you're going to find it informative. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, as we come out of uh, lockdown and COVID and, and all the concerns, I hope that you're all safe and healthy, especially during these difficult times. And then just a couple of uh, basic webinar housekeeping uh, bits and pieces. You'll find that um, you are muted and that your video is turned off and that's just the functionality of the Zoom webinar. So um, don't be too concerned about that then uh, it'll be great if you can um, use the chat box to introduce yourself, tell us where you are uh, in the world, and also let us know what your expectations are of the webinar. So that'll be great. And then if you have any questions during the, uh, the webinar, please make use of the Q&A box to ask your questions. If you pop it in the chat box, I might not pick that up. Uh, but what I do ask is that maybe hang back a little bit busy, uh, with your questions because you might find as Lauren uh, continues with her talk that some of the questions you might have might just be answered. But by all means, do ask away. Now, the webinar replay will be available tomorrow via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube and Facebook channels. So um, you'll receive an email with that. And if you want to just hop onto those channels, you'll find it. And then uh, once again, remember, stick around till the end uh, of the webinar for the lucky draw. Uh, who knows, you might be a winner. And then for the folks that are joining us via the Facebook live stream, great to have you on board. Unfortunately, we can't enter you into the uh, lucky draw, but it's great to have you on board. So um, I'm going to do a quick introduction, um, uh, meet Lauren, and uh, I'll then hand over to Mike. And after that, we can kickstart the, uh, the webinar. So Lauren is an accomplished uh, wildlife presenter, zoologist, marine biologist. And this part I really love. Um, uh, you know, she has a love for uh, conservation and creative natural history storytelling. So I'm sure we're in for quite a webinar this evening and currently presenting live wildlife broadcast twice daily from national parks uh, in South Africa for Wild Earth, which I'm sure she'll talk a little bit more about. So uh, today she's going to talk about, you know, some of her diving and wildlife adventures. And I'm sure she'll tell you um, where she is at present. If we do lose her, uh, the signal might not be all that great. Just uh, bear with us and uh, we'll get her connected or she'll just uh, reconnect again. But for now, before I hand over to Laurel, just a quick word uh, from our sponsor, Pisces Divers, Mike Nokia. Um, before I hand over to him, I'm going to just try and play you a nice little um, uh, sort of introduction video I have. Let's see if I can get that up and running, Mike.
Great, Mona, thanks very much. Um, that little video was actually shot by a guy called Jason Boswell, a very talented uh, videographer. It came through a bit jerky there, but uh, it is worth checking out. He's a, he's a very talented guy and uh, he's done some amazing work. And, and yeah, that, that little video just showcased some of the beautiful inshore kelp forests around Simonstown um, and some of the life, some of the fish and small sharks that we get in the kelp forest. Um, yeah, and thanks also, Mona, just for showing those, uh, those pictures of the tees and the hoodies. You'll notice that we used a, a model with interesting facial hair as well, just as a small <laughs> nod, nod to, to the CEO of Diane with his interesting beard. We thought we'd, <laughs> we'd, we'd use someone with an interesting mustache. So, yeah, maybe mm. he's hoping to get a job at Dan, you know? All right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll be sure to get in touch with him. So, Mike, tell us a little <laughs> bit uh, in brief about Pisces and what people can expect for those that don't know. And uh, yeah, then we'll hand over to Lauren. Great. Well, we, uh, we're a dive center that, uh, that started in 2002. So we've been around, around for a little while. We started off in the, the center of Cape Town in Tamboorskloof. And then we moved down to, to where the good diving is, down to False Bay. We were in Glen Cairn for quite a few years. And for the last uh, seven years, we've been, we've been in Simonstown, uh, right, right on Long Beach, um, in a big old a uh, railway good shed that we've converted into a dive center with a pool and and a nice training facility. So yeah, we're a, we're a paddy five star IDC center. We run uh, career development programs and we we do daily charters out uh, on on our ribs and and on our um, on our batcat out to uh, you know inshore dive sites in False Bay and also beyond Cape Point out to the pelagic waters where we do birding trips and uh, diving with the blue and mako sharks as well. So mm. we, yeah, other than that, we're we're basically a full service dive center. We have a big servicing and rental section, and we we're very active with training, and uh, we also do the sardine run as we were chatting about a few minutes before we started the the webinar and. Uh, Every now and again, we'll do a trip up to Sudwana, Mozambique, Madagascar, or, or further, further afield with our local Cape Town divers. So that's Pisces. Yeah, we, we're, um, we're also super stoked to just be involved in the webinar in, in a small way. And uh, just want to say that we've, we've really enjoyed the webinars that, that have been happening during lockdown. It's been a great thing to just uh, forget about everything for a while, tune into something and listen to someone, you know, inspiring talking to us. So yeah, great that we could be involved in a very small way this evening. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mike. That's great. Um, and, and again, thank you for sponsoring the prizes. Um, Lauren, can I hand over to you? And um, yeah, thank you for participating. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my signal's bombed out twice already. So if it does, I really apologize. I'm in the Kalahari at the minute and I will just rejoin again once that happens. So fingers crossed it doesn't. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you now. Uh, here we go. There we go. Just let me know when you get it. Can you there see that go. okay? Yeah, perfect. Sure. All right. We lost Heal. you there for a bit. Oh, no. Okay. I really hope this is going to be fine. Um, am I back? Am I good? Yes, you're good. Uh, we're ready for you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, my, my career has been really, really diverse. And I think um, going back to my sort of younger frustrations, I can now look back in hindsight and try to give maybe some people some advice on what used to frustrate me and how I got around it and how I maybe got to where I am today. So if all of you are experienced divers, maybe this will be nothing new to you, but I think from my experiences, maybe I can just give something back. Um, I am a huge manta ray fan. They're probably the most fantastic animals I have ever came across in my life. So I just wanted to share some of the work that I have done on lanta rays. Just gonna try and go to the next slide. 
There we go. So I was uh, one of the regional managers for Mansa Matcher, and I'm not sure if you've all heard of this. Maybe some of you have. It's a website. I'll give you the address and the link at the end. And it's a program run by sort of Wild Book. And basically, when before I graduated with my master's, I did tropical coastal management, I felt really frustrated that I had so much knowledge because I taught well, but I just wasn't able to contribute. Now, science is a wonderful thing. I'm a scientist, but my frustrations came in. It can't just be for the scientists. It can't just be for these people, the people that are doing their bachelor's or their master's or their PhD, they get to study. It can't just be those people that get to contribute to the ocean. And that was my biggest frustration. And I did end up going on to get my master's. But prior to that, I want to contribute. I want to do my part. I also have that knowledge. I'm also in the ocean. So this thing that we now call citizen science, it doesn't sound like much, but it's actually the most incredible tool because anyone, any where, no matter what you're doing, no matter what your abilities are, can actually contribute to programs. And for me, that's actually sort of more beneficial for the global protection of the oceans than separate projects done by universities or bodies that you can't access, if that makes sense. So a project like this is citizen science if you're a snorkeler. Even if you're not a snorkeler and you're just floating on the surface in a life jacket, and you're not kicking and you're not moving or if you're an experienced diver everyone can contribute to this program now as you can see from the images here there's two different species of manta rays you've got the alfredi and the bryostris so no matter where you are in the world as long as you're able to get an image it doesn't have to be the best image you've ever taken of the ventral side which is the underneath the sort of manta ray tummy they all have a unique spot pattern their genitals are there as well so immediately that gives you a lot of information information about this individual that you're seeing and even if you're not able to identify the sex or you're not able to identify that individual all you need to do is to go on to Manta, Manta Matcher it's a bit of a mouthful and upload this photo um, there's a special algorithm and the algorithm then reads the Manta spot pattern so then you have people like me or what I used to do before I moved back onto land who will just check that the algorithm's got it right will match up the manta and we'll be able to get back to you the website does it on what manta you saw was it a new one is it one that's been seen before has it got new shark bites on it is it now missing its tail where does it come from is it a boy is it a girl is it pregnant and i just think you get all of that information from one photo and maybe the person that was taking that photo didn't necessarily understand what they were seeing but that's a massive contributor to this database which is a huge global database now with manta rays from the galapagos from south america from south africa from maldives and you're actually able to establish a sort of picture of the global populations and their movements. And I think that's key into understanding animals, whether it's marine animals or terrestrial animals, you need to look at the bigger picture. So this was one of my sort of um, greatest experiences in Maldives. I lived next to a very special bay. I'm sure some of you have heard of it called Hani Faru Bay. It's probably one of the best places in the entire world to see manta. So I had access to these mantas. So instead of just sitting back, I was able to submit all of this data on a, on a daily basis. And it's a fantastic program. So no two manta will ever have the same fingerprint. And it's said that mantas can produce twin pups. It's very, very rare, but it's not impossible. But even those twins will gen genetically be the same, but they'll never have the same sort of fingerprint. And therefore you really can identify the individual. And when you're looking at spot patterns or patch patterns or stripes on zebras or spots on leopards, you've got to make sure that that pattern never changes throughout its lifetime. If it changes from a juvenile to an adult, then you're in trouble. You're not going to be able to identify that individual. So first you need to establish that. And with mantas, it really doesn't change. So that photo can... Oh, I've got a bird flying above my head, sorry. Um, that's... That information from one photo, most people have underwater cameras nowadays, whether it's a, a disposable one or whether it's a really basic one or whether it's a big fancy one in a housing with a lens. Literally anyone can make a difference. And that was my biggest frustration, as I already mentioned. People should not be excluded from contributing to science. So this is just a sort of visual picture here where you really can see that mantas are different. 
Some of them can be really pigmented. Some of them can have lots of spots. Some of them can have hardly any spots. You get melanistic mantas that have got far too much melanin. Then you get leucistic mantas, just as you do many other animals. You can see some of them have got shark bites. Some of them have got injuries. So really, just one of these single photos can give so much information. And I just think every dive center, every sort of organization should encourage people because it makes them good hey i took a photo of baba ganache today yes there is a mansa called baba ganache or hey i took a, a photo of brad pitt today and it just makes you feel good and i think that is the start of the process for education especially with kids once they become part of that program they really feel like they're part of it and it encourages them to learn more and it inspires them so i think i probably spoke a lot about mantas um manta spot pattern here so there's a little manta pop quiz that we have for you all so i think morning you're going to take over on this one yes so uh, <clears throat> uh i've got a, a poll or a pop quiz that i'll launch for the folks uh that are uh, you know watching via via zoom um if you like you can um, show the uh, uh the questions so that the folks via uh, um uh, Facebook can also see. So there we go. For the folks that are on the Zoom call, there are three or four questions. Uh, it'll be great if you guys can answer those. We'll give you a minute or two before we then um, uh, publish the results and just give you the answers at the same time. So while they're busy with that, Lauren, it's, it's amazing. You know, I also spend quite a bit of time with um, mentors and uh, trying to do exactly what you were uh, talking about. And it, it's really, they are fascinating. They're so majestic and I just love being around them. And they, they're great to dive with. Um, well, I guess they allow us to, to participate in, in the activities. But it's, yeah, it just kind of blows your mind, you know, especially when you get that really, really big one. It's just like, wow, it takes your breath away. Yeah, but I think it's just so important to remember they're endangered, you know, they're at risk from mm. so many, you know, arthropogenic factors and boats driving over them and just, you know, yeah. pollution, the pollution in the oceans, they obviously open their great big mouths to suck in the mountain and you'd be so surprised at what gets stuck in there. So I think a lot of people now that I've moved slightly away from the ocean and I'm back on land, a lot of people say, well, what's a manta ray? Is, is that a stingray? Yeah. So, you know, it's just really important to continually, continually educate and inspire and ensure that people mm. are, are not scared of these animals. They shouldn't be scared of stingrays either. But I think once you can make really simple programs that people can get involved in, I'm just so unbelievably passionate about that. Um, mm. I probably had my scariest moment in my diving career with a manta ray. Completely my own fault. Um, I'm a, I'm a free diver, I'm a qualified free diver at Neil Toto. And I had all my guests on board and I, I just saw this female that we actually know. So that's the problem as well. You get mm. to recognize these individuals. So you start mm. to see them a little bit more personally than you would yeah. if it was just a manta. You start mm. to spot them, you know their patterns. And I knew exactly which female this was. Mm. And she was entangled in monofilament fishing line. And which is very common in the Maldives. They use that for fishing, obviously. And I just couldn't, I could not leave her. It was yeah. affecting the way she was swimming as well. So I told everyone on the boat, I'm going down. Uh, took a knife with me. And yeah, I just went down probably far too deep for far too long, which I'm well aware is not sensible in any way, shape or form. Um, yeah. My passion took over, I guess. And yeah, I, I got her free. I've still got the fishing line to this day. And oh, wow. Yeah, everyone loves this story, but the moment I surfaced, I looked back down and she was underneath me and she'd actually turned over. So she was exposing the ventral side with the spot pattern, which is not mm. how a man three technically swims. And she just mm. swam with me for another five minutes. And um, yeah, I mean, you can think what you want of that, but there's a part of me that thinks she recognized that I, yeah, I helped her. Nah, we'll never absolutely. know, though. But yeah, I like I, to think I, I have similar stories in, in various formats of that, but uh, that, that's for another webinar. I'm going to end the, 
<laughs> the poll now. We've got about 50% of the folks that uh, participated, but uh, let's end it and then I'll um, just share those results. So for the folks that participated, um, the, the first question is, is option B. There are two species. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lauren, but as far as I know, it's only two. Um, yeah. The second question, are manta rays fish? So yes, they are. And uh, the third question, uh, what do they eat? Uh, it's uh, number three, so obviously plankton. And um, number four, do manta rays sting? It's something that you were talking about earlier and absolutely not, they don't sting. So there's just a little bit of fun. I'll uh, stop sharing and I'll allow you to continue. Thank you for that, Lauren. Sure, yeah. I... So yeah, just to go back to citizen science, so it's not just manta rays. Manta rays are, you know, they're pretty, they're majestic, they're iconic. You've also got to think of all these animals that don't get that reputation, even sharks. And there's a wonderful project. I really recommend everyone to check out this website called the Olive Ridley Project. And I worked extensively with them. So it might not affect all the areas of the world, but where the Maldives is located is southwest of India and Sri Lanka. Um, basic, basically all the Olive Ridley turtles do this great migration to a, a special place in India on the sort of southeast coast and they call this the Aribada and there's Aribadas all over the world but it means to arrive and it's great big events where all these olive ridleys nest on the beach at one time. What happens is all the fishermen in this area and it's not just the Maldives, it's Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, when they're finished with their nets you can see in the top picture a big sort of conglomerate of net. Once they get damaged, once they get holes or they, they don't function as a net anymore, they're just discarded. But if you can see that big white sort of piece of foam, they all have flotation devices. So what that means is you just have this huge piece of net floating in the ocean. Now, as I'm sure you all know, turtles are reptiles, they breathe air. If they're not fish, they don't sort of breathe underwater and therefore they're always gonna come to the surface. And it's absolutely phenomenal the amount of turtles that get stuck in these nets. I can't even begin to count the number that I have rescued. Now, this little hawk spill and this Olive Ridley in the top photo, they survived. They were fine with really minor injuries. But I mean, some of the turtles that we rescued had already lost three flippers. So by the time we got to this turtle, it has one remaining flipper. We've done amputations, we've done operations, we've stitched, we've sent them to the vet. And it's just so just that these nets that are sort of now being called silent killers are all over the ocean. Now, this is not a small problem to tackle by a long shot. It's a huge problem and it's gonna involve a lot of education and change of practice. But I think what the Olive Ridley Project are trying to do is establish exactly where these nets are coming from, take it back to its roots. So if you see this small little image at the bottom here, that was part of the job. Once you that's inside the net you can actually take the net apart you can analyze it you can how many sort of knots does it have um how is it knotted <laughs> i don't know if that's the right word how is it designed and they can trace it back to where these nets are coming from mm -hmm. and it's not a case of blaming the country or blaming the area it's a case of right this place needs work we need to go and educate and maybe sort of see how we can change these practices. Um, then there's the problem once you have the net on land and you've rescued the turtle, what on earth are you going to do with that sort of big piece of net yourself? You know, then there's the issue of waste and plastic. And I'm going to actually come to this a little bit later on. Um, but again, I think education is the key part. So anyone in the world that finds a net like this can actually go onto the website and it gives you instructions. It tells you the protocol of what to do, how you can report this, how you can analyze the nets. I mean, I don't know anything about nets, but it gives you the instructions and you can just upload all your findings. It's super simple. And it provides the Olive Ridley project with so much valuable data that they can trace where the nets are coming from. You're not gonna be able to solve a problem until you're able to get to the root of the problem. So again, it's, a, it's slightly different from the manta rays, but it's a great way of, if you do find a net, what do you do with it? Well, first you remove it from the ocean, of course, and then two, take it apart. 
And it's actually really interesting, you know, to look at how nets are designed and how you can trace them back. Um, so yes, it's absolutely decimating the Olive Ridley population that crosses in that area of Asia. But of course, you can see here, there's a little hawksbill there as well. We found greens. Um, so it's not just the Olive Ridleys, but they are the ones that are the sort of worst affected, if you like. And talking about turtles, there's another ID project and it's incredible. I love it so much. Um, just like the mantas, most animals actually, I do ID work on um, leopards, lions, zebras, giraffes, you know, most, well, mammals at least have an area that you can identify it individually. And for turtles, it's the facial skews. So just behind the eye, as you can see in the top one, no two turtle will be the same. And again, the same as the mantas, it doesn't, doesn't change throughout that turtle's life. Yes, the scales will get bigger because naturally the, the hatchling is going to grow, but the actual pattern that's on the skates is going to stay the same. So this is a, a complete non-invasive technique. You're not tagging them, you're not coloring them, you're not putting a big thing on a shell. You can literally just take a photo, anyone, diver, snorkeler, floater with a life vest, and you can submit it to the Olive Ridley project. And of course, you're gonna need your area, you're gonna need the date, but that's gonna provide so much information on turtles, their movements. Most turtles in the Maldives, at least, they stay on their, their natal reefs. They really don't go mm -hmm. too far. But in other parts of the world, that might not be the same. So it's just so valuable, someone with a camera. Instead mm -hmm. of just putting it on Instagram, you can actually just simply upload it to these websites and again mm. it's the same as manta rays i won't repeat myself it just gives that person a feeling of being part of science and they really are a part of science you don't need to be a phd student you can really do this yourself um this little individual at the bottom here with the, the hook in her neck her name was ali and she was a turtle that I followed. She's a hawksbill for years and years and years and years. And one day I just noticed she wasn't swimming how she normally is swimming. And this was because she's really badly injured. So I actually asked one of the local guys who are very well known for catching turtles to catch her for me. I don't have that skill. I don't have that strength. And they managed to catch her. It's pretty simple. She was weak and, you know, you hook a turtle by the shell and, and you can get her up. And we took her to a human hospital and we had no choice. The doctors and nurses just thought we were absolutely insane. And, and we x-rayed her. And luckily, the hook wasn't actually going through her esophagus. It was just sort of going through the outer part of skin. So the vet, not myself, managed to operate on her. And we completely rehabilitated her and made sure she got the all clear and put her back in the water again. But because we knew everything about her due to this program, we knew how old she was, we knew it was a female, we knew what her natal reef was, we knew her behaviours. And I just think, although the rescue attempt was something completely separate, that made such a difference to the story that we knew which individual we were rescuing. So again, if you take a photo, the program that you're sending the photo to will be able to recognize if there's possibly an injury that wasn't there before or if something was wrong. So it's not just mantas, it's not just turtles. There's some incredible programs out there, but these are the ones that I personally worked on. And just to touch really quickly on the, on the fishing net, I ended up with so much um, fishing line and a net on my property that I really didn't know what to do with. And... 2016 El Nino event hit us hard in Maldives. It decimated, or well, they think around 80. It's actually higher than that now. I'm sure the percentage is much higher, but it's not been confirmed of coral loss in the Maldives. Mm. Maldives is no longer the pristine paradise that it once was, I'm afraid. Mm. And there's lots of studies that say you can plant coral, um, you can fix it onto rock, or you can fix it onto frames. Lots of resorts are doing this. But there was a part of me that wasn't entirely sure about putting all this sort of corrugated iron or all this metal back in the water. There's also studies that show coral fragments perform better when they're suspended because they're receiving lots of current flow, all the nutrients, the sunlight. So instead of just being fixed sort of on the bottom, if they're suspended, they actually perform better. So we only used Acropora 
um, which is the fastest growing of all corals. And we only use naturally broken fragments, which can break from waves or even turtles or triggerfish, you name it, they can break the coral. And we just collected them and we decided to reuse the fishing line. We cleaned it all. And from the bottom image, you can see we hung it from a sort of um, a jetty. We suspended all these fragments and it was literally the fastest I have ever seen coral grow. It had everything it needed. So once it grew to a certain size, of course, we cut the rest of the line off and then we transplanted it back onto the reef. So then we would take the fishing net out, clean it again and just start again. So instead of putting heaps and heaps of metal in the ocean, we just used a tiny minuscule amount of reused fishing line. Now, yes, it's plastic, but it's recycling and it's using your own initiative to hang this coral. Where else is this plastic going to go? So it was a really cool experiment. It got a lot of recognition and um, yeah, the coral thrived. So I guess my point here is just to say, again, it's citizen science. Anyone could join me. Anyone could take a piece of coral with my guidance and do it and be part of it and understand coral. So a lot of people out there that struggle to understand exactly what coral is and how it grows and how it plays its part. So if you're able to participate in a program like that, not only are you trying to help, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, you're also learning about this magnificent animal that doesn't appear to be an animal and help restore the reefs. Now, I'm not saying that this is the program that's going to save the reefs because the reefs are in big trouble, especially after the El Nino, but it's, it's better than nothing. And I think at this stage, education is the key. So if you can get a 10 year old and you can get them to plant a coral and send it photos, you know, that 10 year old is never going to forget that experience or that little piece of coral. So that was just a really cool experiment. You can really sort of stop following the, the herds and, and, and create your own sort of way or program, should we say, as long as there's a little bit of science there, you can really, really make a difference. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey. I've left the ocean for now. I'm sure it's going to be temporary. Um, but what I noticed in my career is that there's very much an us and them thing. I don't know if I'm going to explain this very well. But, um, I, you know, we're a diver. We're the ocean. We know everything about the ocean. And then you move on to land and you've got the sort of South African field guides who are like, ah, we're field guides. We don't do the ocean. We're on land. But actually, I think my role at Wild Earth, I'll give you all the link later, is very much to try and integrate both of these realms. Um, one of my icons, Sylvia Errol, said, you know, without any blue, there wouldn't be any green. They are so connected in more ways than one. And yes, some people will prefer to be diving. Some people will be, prefer to be on a safari vehicle. But I think we need to stop looking at things from small pictures, you know, looking at this little ecosystem in the low veld of South Africa, uh, this little place where I am now in the Kalahari, you need to connect every single dot. And that's what I try to do in, in my job in Wild Earth. I won't ramble on too long, I promise. Um, but I originally went there to do Dive Live, which was a pioneering project to educate people live from underwater so i'm underwater i've got a full face mask on i've got a microphone i've got speakers you're attached to your cameraman as you can see from that the top right and you talk and it goes live and you can interact with people you can answer questions in real time which is really cool someone in canada can send in a question on youtube and you get it in your speaker while underwater and you can answer it and i think the underwater realm is not as accessible as land. And although we're all passionate and part of Dan and we love diving, I think there's a lot of people out there that are still terrified of the ocean and they don't understand it. So it was a pioneering project to try and connect the dots a little bit. You know, I'm here, I'm underwater, I'm alive, I'm talking, and I'm going to show you the coolest things you've ever seen. Um, so that was in the Caribbean, that was in Grand Cayman. And then I got the opportunity to potentially move on to land and educate people from the low veld in South Africa and the Maasai Mara in Kenya. And I'm still doing it to this day. But what I make sure I do on a daily basis is always connect to the ocean. 
you know you can really relate lions and sharks you can really talk about the social structure of the surgeon fishies with the social structure of impala it's not all that different everything actually is related the sort of ecosystems and the biological natural world it's not separate the fish don't behave really that different from how a herd of impala behave apex predators at the top like your sharks don't really behave that differently from how lions behave and i know to some people that might sound really crazy but that's what i try to do on a daily basis just make Make people think of the bigger picture rather than just your big five you know your leopards your lions your elephants your rhinos and your buffalo try and just connect them there's also a big five in the ocean right so that's my work at wild earth and i i will um show it show you the link at the end of this chat and um yeah just recently i got appointed a uf ambassador so I now do lots of work for WWF and my first project was in Ethiopia with my partner and the series will be launching in November. So we went out there to look for the Ethiopian wolf. There's only 450 left in the wild. It's Africa's rarest carnivore, Africa's rarest canid. And the story behind the wolf is just incredible. Um, so yeah, that will be launching in November if anyone's interested. And we're hoping that our next series is gonna be underwater. It's a little bit tricky filming from underwater. Um, salt and water and technology don't really go, believe it or not. So you can have some hiccups underwater. Um, but yeah, we're hoping our next series for WWF will be an underwater focused one. Um, so yeah, I think I've talked to everyone's ear off. These are just some links if you are interested in anything, any of the projects. Um, Wild Earth, it, it runs twice daily. Um, you can just jump on a live safari and watch us all bumble about the bush and crash into trees and break your steering rods and snap your doors when you're following a leopard. I did all of those things. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and I'm always on Instagram. If any of you want to reach out with any questions, I think that's the, the best place to find me. Yeah. Yeah. So Lauren, wow, that, that's pretty amazing. Uh, just to let everybody know all the links that you've shared, I will share that in the follow-up uh, email as well that you'll receive tomorrow. So um, uh, if you can leave that up for those that would like to um, uh, grab those in the meantime, that's fine. And for the folks viewing via Facebook, I'll also put all those links in there. So it's easy to grab, um, uh, you know, if, if you want to follow um, uh, Laurel, Lauren's uh, journey and in fact I just need to add I, I really like the analogy between the fish and the antelope and the sharks and the lions I never really thought of it like that but I guess it's true and in fact uh, some of my kids during lockdown hopped on some of your uh, live shows and that was you know early morning drive or whatever so that was pretty cool uh -huh. and in fact we, we created cool. these yeah, we created little um, uh, watch parties amongst the, the, the people in the neighborhood. So that was great. So um, are you up for a couple of questions? If people have any, um, are you fine to, to take those? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I see Gillian uh, Brink put up her hand. And um, I don't know if you have a question. Um, if you do, uh, let me know in the uh, chat or the, the Q&A box. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's have a chat. Uh, so I see there's uh, Leo that uh, uh, connected with us yesterday from Mozambique. Thank you, Laurel, uh, Lauren, for such an interesting talk. Um, and let's see if there are any, I don't know, anybody else, uh, questions uh, that you have for Lauren on some of the projects or uh, just her experience? Leo, I will get back to you. I promise we have terrible Wi-Fi here, but I will get back to your email. I promise. <laughs> All right. So a couple of questions coming in from uh, Gerard Grobler. Uh, do you also dive with sharks? He wants to know. Yes, 100%. Um, I did a marine conservation project in Fiji many moons, many, many moons ago. And um, yeah, there's a, a fantastic place here called Benga Lagoon. Um, it's spelled B E. QA and what they tried to do there was to get the locals to stop fishing the sharks and by doing this they created a sustainable tourism operation where 
they now operate this huge sort of shark feeding dive site. Now, I know there's lots of controversy against that and for that, but just let me explain where you can actually dive in that exact same area with the fishermen who used to fish the sharks, who are very much encouraged to be part of it. You go down, are fed, you watch, you have this incredible experience. I mean, tiger sharks and the fishermen are paid a percentage of your dive fee. And it sort of goes to them um, for not fishing. And I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that, but it's, it's a good sort of program that's actually worked in the area that the shark populations are thriving. And mm. I think that's just due to educational and just supporting the fishermen. Don't just take their livelihood away from them. Yeah. Give them another opportunity. And a lot of the fishermen are now dive masters and they, they just think it's great. You know, they don't want to fish them anymore. So yes, I dive with tiger sharks and whale sharks in Maldives and Hanifaru Bay. Um, yes, sharks mm. are epic and completely mm. misunderstood. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was actually on a webinar a couple of weeks ago, and there was also a researcher that's getting a lot of the uh, international divers that visit Honduras involved in some of the citizen science and exactly how they, um, you know, get the local fishermen and their kids more involved with these projects. And it was quite interesting and a little bit sad due to COVID, a lot of that uh, citizen science and the research and obviously tourism that funds that, uh, you know, also had a, a quite a huge impact on that. Anyways, he has a very interesting question from Jolene van der uh, Antwerp. Uh, do manta rays change color as they grow older? Not that I'm aware of. They obviously get bigger. Um, yeah. Manta rays are sort of bicolored, so they're very dark on the on the top the dorsal side and light on the underside. And this is called cancer shading. And many animals have it, impalas have it, fish have it. And it's when the animal's darker on the top, so they can camouflage, let's just say manta ray, um, mm. when they're this sort of aerial predators are looking down, that manta ray is going to blend into the darkness and the sort of dark, cold ocean. Mm. Now, when you're a predator looking up like a shark, the white of the manta ray's belly is going to blend into the sort of white of the surface of the ocean. So it's called cancer shading and it's a real 3D effect on so many organisms out there. Um, but as far as I'm aware, they don't change color. If they're melanistic yeah. or they're leucistic, they'll be that way from birth. And mm. as I mentioned, the spot pattern doesn't change either, which is incredible. Um, and it just means you can follow a very young manta ray right throughout its lifetime. All right. Um... So we got one from uh, Lorraine Le uh, Leach. Thank you, very uh, interesting. How much uh, interaction, uh, I guess, do you uh, do the, uh, get with children? Is there much participation? Okay, so a lot of children involved with some of the projects, are there in the past or currently that you are involved with? I hope that's um, yeah, the right I question, mean, Lorraine. All the yeah, all the projects that I mentioned to you, um, I launched or, or participated in from Maldives and there were all children on board. I mean, the children are the future, um, especially maybe not the rescue and turtle one so much, but especially the mm. coral one. I mean, we had children after children coming in, just so fascinating. Like this tiny little gooey, slimy, hard piece of rock was actually mm. a bunch of animals living together. You know, so it's yeah. the biggest um, amazing thing when you see a kid's face just going, really? Um, so yeah, and even what I'm doing now on the live safaris, um, a certain portion of the drive is dedicated to kids only. So we won't answer any questions from adults. Um, we'll only answer from kids. We also do school drives for specific schools and hospitals as well. Mm. Okay, so we've got one from uh, Russell Opland, uh, similar to the uh, Ridley Turtle Project in the Maldives. Is there anything in South Africa for turtles or any other species? I'm familiar with uh, and support marine uh, action, re uh, you know, action research in Zavora, Mozambique with their manta research. So basically just, I guess, uh, Russell would like to know if there are any opportunities, I guess, uh, to participate in, in studies uh, in and around the South African coastline. 
Um, I really believe that the Olive Ridley project are extending that too. So it's not just Maldives. Maldives is where they started because it's quite mm. accessible waters. And obviously the Olive Ridley turtles are going up that way. But you also find turtles throughout Africa. And I think they're establishing a lot of projects there as well. Um, so I really might recommend checking out that website. And I think you can upload your photos. I mean, it just takes one person to start. I mean, you go diving yeah. in Zanzibar. You can be the yeah. first person to log a turtle from Zanzibar yeah. that's just an example but yeah the Olive Ridley project I know are covering the the continent of Africa as well yeah okay all right so I mean through the links that you shared most probably folks will be able to 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 get more information they're, they're great questions so if you still have time I'd like to to run them past you is that fine uh, Lauren yeah of course all right, so uh, Amishan, um, if we have ideas, programs, apps, or other thoughts on things uh, we can do to perhaps encourage conservation, et cetera, what's the best way uh, to get these, these ideas out there, especially when uh, you or I'm working full-time and unfortunately can't dedicate time to the ideas? I would love uh, to push this, uh, something with a passion and mean way, uh, means uh, to make something work. So I guess this is a person that's, you know, employed full time and uh, nice to have you on board again. Uh, you was on last week as well, uh, but would like to get involved with these projects. I guess through uh, what you were um, uh, promoting earlier, uh, get onto these sites um, and, and start participating in the citizen science projects, um, unless you have some other uh, tips. I just think wherever you are, obviously, if you're working full time, maybe if you go on um, long weekends or vacations, I think it's really key that you educate yourself on where you're going and what you might see and what you can involve yourself in. I mean, we had a lot of people come to Maldives. They have quite um, severe monsoons and where quite a lot of people arrive in a really, really bad monsoon where you see lots of mantas, which is great, mm. um, but it's also really severe weather. And some people would arrive and say, where's the sunshine? We paid this amount of dollars. Why is it not sunny? Yeah. And it just mm. baffles me that they didn't do their research. You know, this is a bad monsoon. It's not going to be yeah. nice. Yeah. So I yeah. think just do your research. Um, if you're going to a place where there's turtles, you know, mm. just spend some time online. And if you do have any ideas, whatever they may be, try to reach out to the relevant bodies. Like, you know, Mike has a dive center. If you're going to an area near there, I'm sure you could always reach out to dive center mm. owners or marine bank or experts I think everyone is open to ideas well, yeah almost everyone. yeah yeah and you know citizen science as you said has, has grown uh, phenomenally worldwide in, in all different fields I mean Dan's got some that uh, you know we do with the, the dive safety side of things which is really great um, and once people get involved with it, they just want to keep giving because yeah, yeah. they realize that there's a potential to improve or yeah. participate. So yeah, I have another great question from uh, Donnell Wenzel. Uh, do you have any recommendations uh, for a young marine biologist on how to get involved in conservation initiatives? So that's, yeah, that's quite a biggie, but um, I guess with your experience, you might have some tips and tricks. It's tough. I get this a lot. A lot of people reach out to me. How do I get started? How do I get started? And it's tough. It was even tough when I was younger. Um, all those years ago, it wasn't easy. But I think passion always trumps. And I think... As I mentioned, research every area that you're going. If you're going on vacation to the Kruger Park, what's there? What can you help? What can you report? You know, there's lots of programs where you can report your leopard sightings so they can get data on the leopard. There's, if you see an injured animal, or specifically a rhino or something like that, you can contact these organizations. And it's exactly the same for the ocean. And if you really, really are passionate about conservation, I think volunteering and interning is really important. Dive mm. center are always looking for interns mm. um, most conservation organizations they maybe don't have a lot of money so they're probably always looking for people to support and that just mm. gives you experience it gives you um, it connects you to people in that industry and I just think keep going and study 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 okay. that's the most important thing always keep up yeah. to date with everything yeah. that's going on so just keep banging on doors until you uh, until yes, you get what you 100%. want yeah Yes. So, so there's, there's another question from Russell Opland, uh, sort of asking, uh, can we crowdsource turtle photos on social media sites for marine biologists to use for research? So 
Uh, if I understand correctly, Russell, um, you uh, suggesting that uh, people uh, sort of uh, create a library, say by a group or something like that, that um, I guess biologists and scientists can access and then do what they, they do. Um, is that the ideal way or is it rather just to go to the dedicated sites and upload um, uh, the information and, and you know, go straight to the source? I mean, that's a tricky one. I think um, you could, I mean, you could start a Facebook page, just getting everyone to submit their turtle photos. You know, there's lots of people that probably take hundreds of photos of turtles and then they just sit on a hard drive or, you know, and you can just spread the word. I mean, you can, mm. you can publish and post just reminding people if you yeah. have images of turtles, don't throw them away or don't lock them away. You can send them, you know, you can be the middleman encouraging mm. people to send them to this organization. Um, yeah. I'm always happy to give my photos away if they're going to help. So I'm sure there's many mm. other people who are as well. All right, so uh, we're getting to the end of the questions, but Samantha Hickman, any advice for someone who graduated with uh, BSc honors uh, and then in brackets, uh, working with turtles in Sudwana, uh, struggling to get into this field uh, of work. Thank you, you are a true inspiration. So I guess very similar <laughs> to the uh, question above, keep banging, uh, asking those questions, find out, um, and maybe possibly by following some of your links, there might actually be opportunities through uh, some of the work or connections you have to, to explore yeah. opportunities. I mean, I know the Olive Ridley project, they're always looking for interns. I mean, it's not paid, but it gets your foot in the door, gets your experience levels up. I know that um, in Maldives, they're always looking for volunteers to help out at various places. You're welcome to reach out at me and I can give you a list of places. Now, obviously, with COVID right now, I'm, I'm sure that's put a lot of things on hold, but it can give you some ideas um, for planning ahead. There's so many organizations that are looking for help. Mm, okay. So if you have any of uh, the links that you haven't shared, uh, Lauren, you can always just message, uh, send them to me and I can add them to that follow-up email. So here's a really sure. interesting question. Uh, Chris uh, uh, Barfoot, governments uh, play a large part in how well conservation projects take off. So clearly a nice statement there. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they present quite a barrier. How have you convinced those uh, which are initially hesitant to help. So there's, there's quite a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing me under the bus here. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess... <laughs> Maldives is tricky and it's still tricky. Um, it's a developing country, although we think of it as a sort of place where all the celebrities go and it's got all the money. It's not. It's a, it's a developing country. It's not got fresh running water. The education system's um, slightly weak. The government are... Oh, I don't even know the words, the correct words that I could use here, mm. but that that's the trickiest part to encourage. Mm. And I think when you are thinking of setting up programs and projects, what was possibly forgotten about in the past was mm. giving back you can't just take, you can't take, 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 mm. you've got to give back. You know, there's a lot of programs just like Man to Matcha and the Olive Ridley. I spent all my years in Maldives going to schools, teaching, dressing up as turtles and doing little, you know, um, lectures. I even dressed up as a manta, you would not believe it. And I flapped <laughs> around all day. Um, I offered all the, all the schools. I know this not government but I offered the schools um, free swimming lessons believe it or not in Maldives mostly all the locals cannot swim and yet they're mm. surrounded by water on tiny little mm. islands you know give them swimming lessons for free invite them over onto your boat take them to Hanifaru Bay it's right next mm. door to their island why should all these tourists get to go to Hanifaru Bay and see the mm. manta rays when they can't so I think it's just all about giving back and it's not a take 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 approach so when you are mm. going to government you need to be able to give back not to the government themselves but to the country or to the local people at the end of the mm. day that's really what's most important so appeal to the masses and then you can get that sort of um, momentum to then negotiate uh, with the powers that be so to speak Absolutely. I guess yeah yeah. yeah. So um, here's a question, and um, I mean, I can answer this, but I'll allow uh, uh, Mike and Lauren to, to maybe contribute here. Um, there's a question from, uh, let me just see, Hendrik Kutzer. Where in South Africa along the Natal coast is the best place to dive with mantis? Mike, maybe I can hand over that question to you. Yeah, Mike, that one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm putting you, you on the know spot. Better than me, Lauren. Uh, yeah, you are a bit, but it's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, we 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 don't uh, get them down in Cape Town. Uh, well, occasionally the, there's a manta spotted, mm -hmm. but um, you know, typically one that's in trouble that's been that's been swept yeah. down and into the cooler waters and is is is. is you know, struggling, but yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say Sudwana Bay um, and yeah. even Alawul Shoal are, are, are two great, great places to yeah. to see mantas in South Africa, particularly yeah, I, um, Sudwana, I would say. Yeah, I agree with you, Mike. I think from a Natal coastline and being so close to to Moz with the, the warmer uh, waters there, um, you tend to find quite a uh, you know regular sightings of mantas. Maybe not the biggest ones always, but they are there. And then, um, um, Henrik, if you are a bit more adventurous and uh, want to cross the border when that's allowed, you know, head up to sort of Indian Barn area, Torfu, Kinjata Bay side, all those areas. They they quite uh, well known for, for uh, uh, mantis sightings on, on the reefs there. Um, there's a question, yeah, not really related to, to the talk, but in many ways, uh, you know, we have brought it up at, uh, at times. Uh, Jenny McKenzie wants to know, when are we allowed to scuba dive again internationally due to COVID-19? I don't think there's a real straightforward answer to that. Um, you know, as different countries and uh, continents or so forth around the world open up, uh, you know, there's a lot of or local diving, uh, but internationally, some places have opened up, but, you know, from a South African perspective, it's still closed. I don't think we have a, a clear indication as to when we will, as South Africans, be able to travel. Although in Europe, <clears throat> there's quite a bit of travel, but then again, there have also been, um, you know, uh, some additional uh, steps implemented as there's been a couple of spikes around. Um, so I don't really know how to answer that. I think we just need to uh, keep um, watching the news and uh, listen to the authorities and take it uh, step by step. Uh, let me just see. Okay, we've answered Samantha Hickman's uh, question there. Uh, what is, uh, okay, here's another one from Hendrik Kutzer. Um, what is the, the natural life expectancy of a manta ray? life expectancy as in yeah. the age how long do they yeah how long do they live roughly you know they don't actually know the answer to this question there's a manta that's been recently spotted in maldives because i think that's probably the area that's studied the most just again due to its accessibility the waters are easy the currents are relatively easy um and there's a manta that they believe 80 years old and it's a cartilaginous fish at the end of the day and they don't really have too many predators i mean the tiger sharks will take bites but it's not normally for predation it's normally mm. sort of get out of my way territorial aggressive mm. um so they believe that manta rays can get a lot older than we think they can i mean i don't mm. think they would outlive reptiles but there's a manta that they're estimating that's about 80 years old and they've definitely wow. got one on record that's between 40 and 50 and that's mm. definite so i think they can live mm. a long time yeah yeah and I, and I guess also the populations as you say they're under threat based on yep. all the bits and pieces there uh, i just want to see i don't know if i'm reading this question it's the last one here from jenny mckenzie since you have been back in the water after covid what is the most uh phew, i don't know um thing uh, that was obvious. Ooh, I'm not quite sure, Jenny, I, I'm misreading that there, so I'll leave that one unless you want to retype it. Um, but for the moment, uh, I don't know, maybe some closing words before we wrap up the, the webinar, Lauren, from your side, and then Mike, I'll give you uh, an opportunity as well. No, um, thank you everyone for participating. It's such a pleasure. I really was worried about the Wi-Fi, but it held on. Um, yeah. So yeah, ocean and land. I'm so passionate about both. You are welcome to reach out. And yeah, we'll have a series by November. So if you are interested, keep your eye on WWF and we will pop up. <laughs> okay. So Mike, just before I hand over to you, I'm going to do the lucky draw for the folks that are still uh, around. Um, I've already added all the names to uh, my random software picker. So uh, uh, what shall we start with, the t-shirt or the hoodies first? Absolutely up to you, Mona. T-shirt. <laughs> hoodie, hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> hoodies and t-shirts, okay. All right, let's start with the hoodies. Lauren, you are the star this evening, so we'll go with your recommendation. Let me just uh, uh, get this going. All right. 
All right. Well, uh, interesting. I've got uh, Ian uh, Buchanan has won a hoodie. And uh, Amanda van Jarsveld from Sudwana has also won a hoodie. So uh, interesting there. Let me uh, cool. just make a note here. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, let me actually just take a screenshot. It'll be easier. All right. All right. So let's do another pick here for the t-shirts this time. All right, so here we go for the T-shirts. Uh, Russell Upland, uh, winner this evening, and Adele van Eerden uh, is the winner for the um, uh, for the T-shirt. So um, I'll get in touch with you folks and uh, put you in touch with Mike, and you know we'll make all the arrangements, sizes, and how to get the things to you guys. And Mike, uh, just thank you for those sponsors. They're really great. Um, I'll hand over to you. Uh, just maybe give us a, a, a little bit of uh, parting words and diving advice, if you like, and, and so forth. Cool. Well, um, thanks, Monet. Yeah, I, I just wanted to share something, which, um, you know, Lauren was talking about citizen science and, and, and a wonderful collaboration, which I've seen um, is the collaboration between the Marine Megafauna Foundation and, and a local dive center in, in Tofu, Peri Peri Divers, you know. And when you go and dive with peri-peri divers, you've always got an intern or a researcher or a scientist on board. And it just adds wonderful value to what the dive center is doing. Because as a dive center owner, you know, we're so involved with the logistics, the planning, the, the equipment, the briefing. And um, those interns can, can just add such a wonderful dimension to the experience by sharing the work that they're doing. Getting the uh, getting the other divers excited about about what they're doing and, and being able to contribute. So <laughs> it's a real win-win relationship that that exists between you know those two entities. And they also do free talks at uh, Barrow Lodge, you know, a couple of times a week, um, either on whale sharks or mantas. Yeah. So it's a it's a real value add to the dive center, but it's also giving them a platform to get their interns and their researchers out into the field. Uh, on a daily basis, you know, so I, I, yeah. I just wanted to share that example of where um, a citizen sciences really uh, integrates really well with a, a, a dive center's function, uh, you know, operations. Um, but yeah, th thanks so much, Lauren. I really enjoyed listening to you and um, I'm going to go and have a look at some of those links that you shared. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to be, to be part, uh, part of this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Monet. Yeah. Well, to both of you, thank you for your participation. And uh, Lauren, thank you. Wow, a great talk, lots to think about. And, uh, you know, people can, uh, maybe there are still hurdles, but um, there are definitely ways to get involved and make a difference. And, and for me, that was the, the big take-home message. So thank you for that. It's been a great talk. Mike uh, from Pisces, all your team, it's always great engaging with you guys. And, uh, you know, as always, thank you for your support. And for all the folks that attended this evening, you know, thank you for sticking around. Uh, even the folks via Facebook, it's been great. Uh, I had loads of fun. I'm sure you guys had too. Um, you know, I will obviously share the replay link and an email that goes out with all these links. And I've also got a couple of Dan uh, information, bits and pieces in the forms of guides and, and uh, little quizzes and, and courses that you can participate in for free. And uh, as always, if you guys want to learn more about Dan, we've got a great website. It's danesa.org. Go there, visit that. And if you're not a member yet, please consider joining and supporting us for, the, for now. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Mike. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And uh, same to the folks that joined. Toodles, ciao, and good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.